first of all, a very warm welcome uh, to you all. Um, I'm uh, John Litton. I'm an independent crossbench peer um, and a member of the uh, Built Environment Select Committee. Um, I'm a child surveyor by profession, uh, and um, for some time I have been concerned about uh, what has been happening uh, following the tragic um, uh, uh, instance of, of, of Grenfell Towers and the issues in particular that are now of such enormous significance to leasehold owners and um, affected not just by cladding issues that, uh, but um, other issues that won't necessarily be covered by um, schemes as they are proposed at the moment and involve, need to say, other significant safety uh, defects in buildings. Um, with me, I have a, a very eminent team of, of people, in, including the Right Reverend Bishop of Kensington, who's immediately to my left, Daniel Greenbow, uh, a, a lawyer, uh, very expert in this area, um, fire safety expert uh, Matthew Hodges Long. Um, uh, and um, I would describe him as activist and entrepreneur Steve Day. Um, we also are very privileged to have uh, with us the Minister of State in the, in the Lords for uh, levelling up communities and housing, Lord Stephen Greenhalge. And so um, to thank, start by thanking all of you for attending today. And perhaps um, uh, given that ministerial time is always at a great premium, could I invite you, Lord Greenhalge, to just say a few uh, introductory words and observations um, in connection with this. Yes, uh, well, thank you for that for that warning. Um, now, it's, it's a real privilege to be here, and and uh, and, and, and the Lord Linton is is an absolute professional and knows knows his onions. And I'm always very scared when I'm at the dispatch box when John Lytton weighs in because there's no one who knows more about um, the technicalities. I think he knows more than my officials, frankly, which is always worrying. So he'll always be better briefed, but equally. And when John supports something, as he is, I know, supporting the approach that the polluter should pay and is supporting these amendments, I really sit up and listen. So, John, thank you for being one of the conveners of mm -hmm. this meeting and, and hosting this in the, in the House of Lords. It makes it easy for me to come along because we're all, as you know, stuck here for votes later this evening, although we probably won't be voting entirely the same way. <coughs> um, <laughs> I, I just want to pay tribute to um, Bishop Graham, if I may, because I know that, uh, you know, Whilst we see residential fires statistically being quite low, about every 10 years we have a tragedy. And of course, we saw the tragedy at Garnet Court in 1999, then in 2009 in Mackinac House, but then in your own patch, um, very close to where I live in Fulham, in Hampton Fulham, the tragedy of Grenfell Fire, which is the largest loss of life of any residential fire since the Second World War. And, and it's really traumatised the, the community, and you're right at the heart of, 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 the, of the action in terms of being the person that oversees that and make sure that the community comes to terms with what was a you know a generational tragedy and that we, we have to learn from and i think it's great that you're here um finding out ways in which we can move forward in a, in a, in a productive way matt Hodges long um is a, a real expert um I, I see him on twitter coming up with information that i would never know i came into politics not being an expert in this stuff but I, de I defer really to Matt's knowledge of some of the um, expertise that's needed to ensure that we have a safer built environment, and I appreciate all he's done. But I, I actually reserve the most praise, if you like, for, for Steve, because Steve is someone affected by this crisis as a RAC resident. But um, I don't think you ever ever stop. I mean, you're essentially a, a human dynamo. I mean, there's no minute of, the, of, of an hour of a of any day, where you, except on Sundays, maybe when you you you, you, find you, go, to when, when you go to HCB, but, yeah. I mean, apart from that sort of that period, you do work tirelessly, and you brought up uh, you know a huge amount of support um, for the principle which we all accept is that the polluter should pay. But also on the line, I, I, we've got two people I also have huge respect for at LKP. I just want to name check Sebastian O'Kelly, that's a a journalist who's been covering this um, for, for for the decades, but also Martin Boyd. That's, I dare say become actually quite a close friend and very, very knowledgeable um, on policy matters and knows how to work with with government and understands the constraints that you have if you want to make things happen. And I appreciate both Steve and Martin um, and trying to be constructive so that we can deal with what is a, a, a monumental crisis that's taken decades to evolve and is you know, very difficult for any, would be difficult for any government to resolve satisfactorily. And now I can't say very much because I'm a junior minister and you can't sort of make huge government announcements, I'm afraid. But what I will say is reiterate the principles that the new Secretary of State has uh, 
as, as put front and centre. The first is that we want to see a <coughs> greater sense of proportion. So that what isn't that a tragedy isn't used by unscrupulous people to magnify unnecessary remediation costs, um, to hike uh, unnecessarily building insurance levels, um, and that we uh, and that we get a sense of proportion, and that we understand where the risk lies. Now that is very important that we achieve that greater sense of proportion, and that's the first principle. The second thing is we want to find a way of protecting leaseholders, and leaseholders and shared owners are victims, and so that government is committed to find a solution that will protect um, leaseholders. And finally, we think that this crisis was driven, obviously there was regulatory system failure and that's why the government's putting up 5.1 billion um, and we'll obviously seek to get more from Treasury, but there's only a finite pot. But we recognise in order to bridge the gap between that 5.1 billion and the estimated 15 billion we often hear, the polluter must pay. And the polluter is not just the developer, but also it's the manufacturers that create, create materials that were woefully inadequate for um, the buildings, the high-rise buildings, um, and also many others. And so seeking to get the polluter to pay, but also, I have to say, professionals that did not do a, did a shoddy job, they should be made liable, which is why intrinsically, beyond the taxes and the levies we're looking at, we also want to have a way of holding people to account for, for doing poor workmanship, which is why I'm very attracted to the work that's been done by by, by Daniel, and, and, and in particular, I pay trade tribute to Daniel, who's given his time free of charge and his expertise to make sure that these um, proposals um, are really are heavyweight legal stuff. So, um, Daniel uh, Rebogan and, and what you've done, I really want to pay tribute to that. That's all I wanted to say as a minister, um, and, uh, and I want to wish this, this, this conference, if you like, well, and, and I appreciate the spirit in which this has been launched, and I think uh, under the stewardship of the likes of John L. Lytton um, and, and with the, the support of Bishop Graham. Um, it's going to be hard for any government minister not to, um, to, to, to do their utmost but to try and go with the flow and make this work in some way or other. Although it may not be entirely how you lay it out, you'd expect the governments to listen and I promise the government will listen and work very closely with, with you all to make sure that the polluter does pay. Um, thank you, Minister, for um, giving us that um, uh, introduction. And of course, um, uh, with regard to the, um, the what is proposed here is is an amendment to the Building Safety Bill, um, and an amendment that would in fact borrow from the polluter pays principle set out in environmental legislation and, and, and a long-standing environmental legislation uh, principle. Um, and it's absolutely right in referring to the question of, of um, liability over a large number of, of, um, of, of potential uh, players here, including uh, manufacturers of, of, um, of uh, materials, those who oversaw the work, and those who actually carried it out. Um, the point being is that um, this is intended to catch situations, this polluter pays amendment, we try and catch situations where the regulatory standards weren't met at the time of construction or conversion to residential use. Um, and that is the that is the touchstone on which this is based. So without further ado, um, I'm going to ask um, uh, Bishop Graham if he would be so kind to um, give his perspective on this, bearing in mind that it was on, on his patch that the, the, the causative and, and absolutely dreadful tragedy of Grenfell occurred. Bishop. Thank you. And uh, very good to see everybody on the call today. Today actually marks four and a half years since the uh, Grenfell Tower a tragedy. In fact, it was four years ago today that we held the um, the National Service of Remembrance at St Paul's Cathedral for those who died at Grenfell Tower. Th this evening, uh, I'll be going up to um, uh, to North Kensington to join the silent walk uh, in memory of those who died uh, on that day, 14th of June 2017. I well remember the day very well. I was there. I saw the tower burn on that day. And since then, I've seen the impact and on uh, the lives and the community that, that has been affected by it. And it's a bit like a sort of stone thrown into a pond, the ripples of spread out beyond it immediately obviously for those who lost their lives for the, the bereaved the families involved the wider community <clears throat> in north kensington and now much more than that the uh, three million or so people around the country who are affected by the building safety crisis i've got three simple points i want to make today in my just few minutes um, speaking to you and i guess the first is really about the, uh, the importance of safety 
I was listening last week to a refugee from Iraq who was asked the question, why did you leave your home? And he, his answer was this. He said, of all the places on the earth, your home is where you are supposed to feel safe. And it was because he didn't feel safe in his home. That's why he uprooted his entire family, despite the disruption that would cause. Safety is such an important aspect of our, of our homes. I was on the, the Archbishop of Canterbury's Commission on uh, Housing, Church and Community. We came up with five key values as to what good uh, housing uh, should, should be like, that it should be sustainable, it should be safe, it should be stable, it should be sociable, and it should be satisfying. Uh, and I think maybe safety is perhaps at the foundation of those values, that home needs to be somewhere where we feel safe. It's a place we rest, it's a place we recover. It's a place that's a base from which we engage with the rest of the world. And so and feeling safe in one's own home is a, is a fundamental core aspect of, of our human life and what we owe to one another, which is why the building safety crisis needs urgent solutions. I guess the second point I want to make is about the moral consequences of home ownership. Um, governments and particularly conservative governments in the past um, decades or so have, have for a long time encouraged uh, people to put their life savings into homes. Um, we're talking about 65% of, of us in the UK own our own homes, and the government is keen to raise that figure. Now, I'm not wanting to debate that policy um, uh, at all, whether it's the right or the wrong thing. But it seems to me that with that policy decision, there comes a moral responsibility to keep those homes safe. Uh, if we had a primarily rental model where we were encouraging people to put their, their money into rent, uh, rental property, then it would be different. Um, if you were in a rental property and your home was not safe, then you could easily just leave that one and go and find somewhere else that was safe. Uh, because we're encouraged to put our life savings into our houses, uh, it's a little bit different. Uh, it's not that, that easy to move on, as many, many people have found uh, in the past a few decades to their cost. And so I, I would want to argue that if uh, the government wants to be true to its own principles, to continue to argue for an increase in home ownership is vital to, to uh, solving our housing crisis and establishing a, a stable and prosperous society, then there also comes with that a moral responsibility to find urgent ways to make those homes safe. And uh, I guess the last point I want to make is, is really about the necessity of sacrifice. I talked about the five values that we came up with uh, on our um, housing commission, but we did come up with a sixth one, also beginning with the word S. And it was the necessity of sacrifice, because as we looked in detail at the housing crisis in our nation, uh, and part of that is, of course, the building safety crisis, we recognise that none of these uh, problems in the housing world in our nation are going to be solved without some element of sacrifice. And that sacrifice borne across the board, not just by those who are at the receiving end uh, of the housing crisis, those in houses that they can't sell because uh, of, um, of safety issues or living in unsafe or um overcrowded or, un or unsuitable accommodation. And that cost needs to be shared by all those in the housing sector, by government, by landowners, by landlords, by housing associations. I also recognise, as a representative of the Church of England, we too are major landowners. We need to bear some of that cost as well. And so when we think about um, uh, solving this housing crisis, we cannot get away from the element. There is going to be an element of cost in it. But it seems to me that one of the things the Polluter Pays Bill does is it actually it actually focuses that cost uh, in the right place, in a morally fitting place. It enables the burden of restitution, putting things right, primarily on those who were originally responsible for the problems that many people around the country are facing. There is an urgency about this issue. We are now four and a half years after Grenfell. Next June will be five years. It'll be a major turning point uh, in our nation's life as we remember five years since that tragedy. Uh, and my hope and my prayer is that by that time, by five years, the five year anniversary of Grenfell, we will have uh, a, a really good solution uh, to the building safety crisis, uh, at least if not some of our wider issues around housing. The government needs a solution to ensure responsibility rests with those at fault, not the least, not the leaseholder and not even the taxpayer. Uh, but where regulations were not followed, the original developer and those responsible for it as well. So I, I would urge the government to take this particular bill, the polluter pays bill, seriously. If not, come up with a better plan, but do it quickly, because there are too many lives that are put on hold the longer we delay. Uh, we, we come now to, I think, um, Daniel Greenberg, is that right? Yes. Um, who is online. Thank you very much, Lord Lytton. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I'm only going to speak for a couple of minutes. Um, and just identify a couple of core points that should be borne in mind when you are discussing these clauses with other people. Um, the first thing, which is terribly important, 
and relates to something that m the minister very kindly said a moment ago, is the importance of balancing flexibility with specificity. This has to be flexible because the scheme has to be made to work in the light of experience. Therefore, we are using two sets of enabling powers so that the provisions of the scheme will be set out in regulations, the funding provisions will be set out in regulations subject to affirmative resolution to give Parliament proper scrutiny powers, and the scheme itself will be a quasi-legislative scheme made under the first clause in the set of amendments. So you need to emphasise to people that we've devised something that is clear on the face of the bill. The, these are not skeleton provisions. They run indeed to over five pages of detail, but because they use a system of subordinate legislation and quasi-legislation, they combine specificity with flexibility. Therefore, the minister and the government will know exactly what we plan to achieve by looking at the detail of the powers, but they will have the flexibility to achieve it in, their, in, in accordance with the light of experience as we go. Second point, the minister and his officials have been enormously helpful in raising specific issues, specific matters, and we have addressed them all. One of the most important points that the minister raised very kindly at an early stage was the danger of this all turning into satellite litigation, and therefore we have used a number of ways, including the use of tribunals for sharply focused, low-level, swift justice in individual cases. We've used a number of ways of limiting the risk of judicial review and extensive litigation. And a key, we, we were asked to get confirmation of this from the bar, and a leading planning silk, a leading planning QC, has certified that indeed the, limit, the, the risk of litigation is entirely reasonable and entirely controllable, and she has very kindly given us a pro bono opinion to that effect. She has also confirmed my certification that the clauses that we have produced are compatible with the Article 1, Protocol 1 of the European Convention on Human Rights. So, first two points, we've met all the department's objections, and we're combining flexibility and specificity. The only other thing I want to say is for about 30 seconds, I'm going to take you through the core components of the scheme so you can see how it works. Number one, the, the Secretary of State will have a duty to establish the scheme. It is not a power. There has been some chat on social media that the clauses don't work because they're a mere power. They are not. They are a duty, and that duty is enforceable at administrative law. Uh, second point, this is focused on construction and building work that was unlawful at the time. There is no retrospective liability involved in the awards. There is the, the, the levy is a construction-wide levy, but there is no retrospective liability. Point number three, uh, the scheme will operate through application made by blocks of flats, and they will, they, will, the, the, they will apply to be certified as eligible. And once that has been done, they will, know, they will then go through to the second stage, which is to ask for an award. So we've deliberately kept those two stages separate. So you satisfy eligibility, and then you discuss awards by reference to what is needed in each case. Fourth point. The scheme will have supplementary subordinate regulations, which will be made by statutory instruments subject to parliamentary scrutiny under negative resolution. And again, that is a duty on the Secretary of State, which will be enforceable by judicial review. Fifth, the scheme funding will be dealt with by a separate set of regulations, which, because they involve effectively imposing a tax on the construction industry, those are subject to affirmative resolution by, um, in accordance with proper parliamentary scrutiny principles. Um, again, there's a lot of detail in the enabling power. There is no suggestion that this is mere skeleton legislation. There are two and a half pages of detail about the, the funding regulations 
content. Um, finally, um, there will be there will be time for everybody to feed into the making of the regulations under the clauses, but because they are regulations, they can be made fast. We can get this up and running in a small number of months, and indeed, the aim will be the aim will be that the Secretary of State, we say in the clauses, the Secretary of State should aim to ensure that the first grants under this new remediation scheme are made and paid within the period of one year beginning with royal assent. That is achievable with the support of the Minister, who has spoken very kindly this afternoon, with the support of both Houses of Parliament. These clauses can be got onto the statute book and then they can be implemented fast, effectively and efficiently. Thank you all very much for listening. Thank you, thank you, Dan. Um, that's uh, a, a pretty, a pretty good comprehensive rundown. Um, right. Well, next up, um, uh, without further delay, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Steve Day if he will give us a presentation of some slides which outline the scheme and and how it works. Steve, over to you. Um, so I'm in South East London, uh, Royal Artillery Keys. And my story is basically, we have a large number of buildings, um, eight very tall ones, um, and each of us had a £31,000 cladding bill and an unknown internal compartmentation bill because the holes above the front doors in the um, flats just weren't filled in and that passes some fire and smoke. It's a simple idea. They just didn't fill in the holes properly. Um, and an extra 3,000 a year of service charge related to insurance um, and waking watch. So that's devastating for all of us, because it's not particularly a rich area of London, but also devastating for shared owners who just don't have um, the ownership to warrant 100% of the bills, some are 25%. So we managed to prove that our developer didn't keep to building regulations in force at the time of construction. Um, and we did that very quickly by having a look at the safety certificate associated with the building. And um, um, basically, we uh, got to a stage where we could show that uh, the builder just didn't keep to regulations, basic things like render thickness, um, adhesive pattern and um, fixings just being um, plastic instead of metal. So we basically proved that and um, we managed to get 1.3 million out of the developer uh, for the internal compartmentation. And then um, later on, we managed to, after some serious campaigning, get um, all our historic um, and ongoing waking watch costs uh, covered and um, our internal work. So that was a total of 2.8 million. Now, some of the things we learned from this is that there are professional reports out there for the Building Safety Fund um, that can show all the breaches and can give determination decisions, provisional ones, based on um, whether these buildings are compliant or not. So that data is out there for a large number of buildings. Um, also, that developers will make voluntary com uh, contributions where they have been shown to be at fault, um, just to preserve their reputation. So um, we took that learning and we thought, right, well, we've got £2.8 million pounds worth of um, pledges from our developer. We want to repeat that now for the whole country. Um, by basically making all those responsible, if we possibly can, pay in full where they're at fault. And um, this is a story, basically, of how we do that. Um, so I won't go too much into the crisis because we don't have a lot of time. But as everyone knows, there's a roughly around 15 billion um, quoted from select committees, so dangerous materials to remove buildings. Leaseholders are basically forced with crippling bills and to facing mental health issues. Um, and we've had some very too serious um, um, deaths associated with this. Um, companies are taking advantage. They're proposing expensive waking watches and um, remediation projects that aren't taking a proportionate approach. Um, and a significant number of blocks um, have missing cavity barriers, missing fire breaks, um, internal compartmentation holes. And uh, we just basically know that there's a huge amount of money that is required and um, a huge amount of work to be done. And we need to fill in the gap. So as everyone can see on this slide, there's 5.1 billion in the Building Safety Fund, but crucially that only covers buildings um, greater than 80 metres and only cladding. And um, what we're trying to do is, at the moment that fund is 
funding both those uh, buildings um, and fire um, remediation work where they're compliant, but the regulations have changed. So we're not saying the polluters um, are basically there. Um, and then basically the uh, other area, the red boxes, those um, fire hazards where uh, the cost of uh, remediation is due to these crucial issues where the builders just didn't do their job properly at the time of construction. So what polluter pays does is it basically says, well, that 5.1 billion, we're not going to take it from the public money. We're going to take it directly where we possibly can from those responsible. And there you can see on that diagram just how um, it's basically showing that the 5.1 billion is just hitting those fire hazards as a result of regulation change instead of uh, those fire remediation costs uh, for defective work. And we're basically introducing fairness and justice back into this. And it's all about trust. The construction industry has lost our trust. They've been cutting corners with our safety. Their lenders don't trust the buildings are safe. The insurers don't trust the buildings are safe. Trust needs to be restored. And until we do that, no one will be able to sell a building again. No one will buy these buildings again. And we will definitely have this crisis for generations to come. Even if we solve it now, we need to solve it for good. That's what Palooza pays is, and our aims are simple. One, protecting leaseholders from all costs, interim, historic and ongoing, and remediation costs for defective buildings. And by doing that, we want to go after and make those pay in full those responsible. Um, and also, where it's not possible, we have um, a wide industry levy um, to basically cover those costs. And we want to prevent a repetition of the Grenfell fire. You've heard Bishop Graham say, um, he's going to be attending that walk um, about those, that tragedy. This is about a legislative solution that ends for future Grenfells going forward. And that's a real key, the future as well as the current. Um, and how does it work? So basically, it's like a car. So if you wanted to buy a car and the brakes fail, then basically you don't expect that um, manufacturer, let's say Renault, to um, ask you to go after the brake manufacturer um, or charge you uh, and cost to, uh, um, you know, service your car while you're waiting for the remediation. You'd expect them to handle it. And then if they want to go after the brake manufacturer after compensating you with a new car, then they'll do that either in parallel or after the event. So that's what we're saying here. We're saying that instead of the car manufacturer, it's the builder or the developer, and that they are basically re recovered the money from the um, public body that we propose to get the money from them. And then after they've compensated uh, the government, the leaseholders aren't involved in this litigation. Um, and there's no litigation at all. As Daniel says, it's a statutory scheme. Um, it's just a, um, a quasi-judicial process to retrieve the money. However, if they want to um, um, go after the cladding manufacturers, for instance, or other parties, they can using satellite litigation. But crucially, it doesn't um, involve leaseholders and doesn't delay the remediations. And um, basically, we've had a look at um, some of the statistics and 60 percent of the housing output comes from the top 10 house builders. Uh, you heard some of these in the list, Barrett, Persimmon, Taylor, Wimpy, Bellway and so on. That a large number of these builders that have the capital to build high buildings um, are still in business. And uh, we're basically going after um, wealthy companies. And uh, the top 10 made uh, 31 billion in operating profit and distributed 12 billion um, to the shareholders. Um, and uh, we also deal with those uh, special purpose vehicles where we have um, developers that just didn't build um, buildings um, with liability attached. They tried to limit their liability by creating temporary companies. So if um, a dissolved or insolvent subsidiary or SBV is involved, we go after the parent company and only then do we hit the industry levy. So we're dealing with um, special purpose vehicles as well. So what does this mean for leaseholders? It means proportionate because we're checking each building uh, and cladding remediation costs for defective building work. Uh, proportionate non-cladding remediation costs for defective building work. Um, waking watch and insurance increased costs associated with defective building work. And crucially, um, emergency grants for those at risk of eviction due to defective building work. So we want to stop that disgusting um, practice of evictions. And um, very, very quickly, I'll just mention how the scheme works. We will make this um, available online, um, these slides. So. Um, uh, 
we will do that. But uh, basically, what happens is the freeholder or building owner um, proposes um, works or interim um, safety uh, measures. Um, if there, there's a sift um, that they have the evidence um, that basically shows um, a good case for building regulation breaches, they then apply to um, a public body for a, a compliance determination, which is where that public body um, on behalf of the government checks if the buildings are compliant or not. Um, if they um, are, um, then it goes to that uh, 5.1 billion public funding. If not, the uh, public body will then identify a responsible party, um, go after the parent company if it's uh, gone bust um, or it's no longer in business and um, finds a responsible party and then recovers the costs in full. And that's the key word, not levies. We're not letting them off. We're not punishing innocent and guilty alike. We're trying to minimise the levy. So we try and get the maximum recovery from those responsible, because this is where we stop it going forward. And if we can't, um, we draw on the levy funding. Um, and then basically the compliance assessments, we believe is a simple, efficient, cost effective scheme. The assessors will basically look at whether the buildings complied with basic things like we mentioned at rack did they comply with AB, the manufacturer's instructions um, or did they rely on a third party certification such as a bba certificate so i'm afraid that's a bit rushed um, but the clauses are now live we have started an online consultation you can go to building safety crisis or register um, and we would love um, industry we would love legal um, any comments from leaseholders anything please register look at the clauses we'll be publishing some explanatory notes and uh that's uh, that's it for me but thank you very much indeed uh, uh, steve um and and thinking about um, the whole question of of um, making sure that good practice prevails henceforward it's very appropriate that we have matt hodges long here to um, talk us uh, to us about the state of building regulation compliance uh, matt over to you Thank you very much. So firstly, before I get going, I just wanted to specifically thank Steve over there, um, who, despite having to battle, I would call it considerable headwinds along the way, both personally and professionally, um, has really fought this battle with superhuman strength uh, for the polluter pays principle. And I think we could probably all agree that without Steve's dedication to this, we wouldn't be here today yeah, yeah. having this conference. So thank you, Steve. So the Grenfell tragedy four and a half years ago today, um, it focused the world's attention on what happens when you get risk management wrong and when you get compliance wrong, when you get regulation wrong. So the post Grenfell investigations continue to expose, even to this, to this day, to this week, um, numerous overlapping failings. And it's a shame that uh, Lord Greenhouse isn't here anymore, but he knows that that started with the government and works right down through the supply chain and the regulatory environment that supports it. So through my pro bono work with the Building Safety Register, which we've been doing since June 2019, um, I've actually managed to read through, I counted up and analyse over 2,000 fire risk assessments for different blocks and over 500 external wall survey reports. So that body of evidence has shown me and reassures me that there are significant breaches of regulations at the time of construction. Um, in most modern buildings, that is widespread. So with regard to the regulatory breaches, I want to make it very clear that I'm not talking about grey areas or the post Grenfell changes in advice. I'm talking about easy to spot, clear as day breaches of regulations that should never have happened. And the primary responsibility for those breaches, in my view, lies with the companies that construct the buildings in the first place, the developers. The company with their name on the site hoarding, the company with their name on the glossy brochure, the company hanging, handing over that you hand over your life savings to in good faith. The company that owes its customers a duty of care first and foremost. If a developer fails to keep essential documentation, that is not the fault of innocent leaseholders. If a developer builds back to front to meet a crazy build programme, and I know about this, I used to do it, this is not the fault of innocent leaseholders. If a developer fails to supervise the work, that isn't the fault of innocent leaseholders. If a developer can't read a drawing, that is not the fault of innocent leaseholders. And if a developer chooses to liquidate a special purpose vehicle to shelter from their liability, not any longer, that is not the fault of innocent leaseholders. These are all choices, choices the developers make. And through the protection afforded to them by the current law, those choices rarely have consequences. 
This amendment not only strengthens the powers of redress for existing buildings, it will also focus the industry mind on over quality, supervision and compliance for all new developments going forward. It's fundamentally unjust for anyone other than the companies that are responsible for this corner cutting, value engineering, mistakes or whatever we choose to call them to pay uh, to remediate these breaches. This amendment is a big step towards placing liability on the correct shoulders. The analysis that I've done does not replace the urgent need for all blocks of all heights to be comprehensively risk assessed, to understand the materials that we used, the quality of the construction and the likelihood of significant compartmentation failure. Generalizing the risk profile of buildings based on their height and saying just because they're low risk, uh, low, low rise, they're low risk, and a few other simple data points is a very dangerous, dangerous path to tread. Blocks of flats are not produced on production lines. They are all unique and should be assessed as such. Over the past two and a half years, I've got to know hundreds of innocent victims of the building safety crisis, many of which are on this call today. Their stories are all heartbreaking. I've also got to see the negative impact the crisis is causing on the supply of social housing and for the day to day management within private blocks. In short, the market is paralysed and trust has been shattered. This trust has to be restored, and this amendment, in my view, goes a long way towards achieving that goal. Unless and until the who pays question is resolved by the government, the psychological torment, financial ruin and market paralysis will continue. The current trajectory of leaseholder bankruptcies will lead to stalled remediation projects of blocks that are deemed to be unsafe at the moment. Those stalled projects and exhausted reserve funds will in turn lead to the fire and rescue services exercising their prohibition powers, which are considerable, to close these buildings down. I've tracked over 19, pro well, 19 prohibitions since the Grenfell tragedy, leading to approximately 7,000 residents being forced out of their homes with next to no notice. I think that what's happened so far is the tip of the iceberg compared to what could be coming very soon if we don't sort this problem out. So this amendment genuinely has residents at its heart. It's created by residents, it's being driven by residents. And to my mind, that's the embodiment of what Dame Judith Hackett told us all to go and do. She wanted residents at the heart of building safety. And I believe that this amendment embodies that in full and the government should take this forward as their own amendment to the building safety bill. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, um, uh, Matt, that's, that's excellent. Going forward with our questions, because I can see absolutely loads now if I open my chat, I think the best thing to do is if you go onto our website, buildingsafetycrisis.org forward slash register, there's, um, after filling out your details, you'll see a link to the polluter pays amendments. Um, you can see the clauses that Daniel has, has drafted, the latest um, draft that we have, and you can leave comments. And if you can um, and wouldn't mind, if you can put those um, questions and comments on the website, we will endeavour to um, deal with those um, um, in a slightly more leisurely um, fashion than, than now, because I'm conscious there's some brilliant points coming through. And this is a large and vital piece of work, um, and we need your help, frankly. We need everyone's comments, and let's make it get better together. Mm. Um, and, you know, I mean, Bishop Graham is going to be walking um, with uh, the survivors of Grenfell and let's bring it back to that at the end and just say Grenfell must never happen again. We must restore trust in regulation compliance. Regulations must be the key to knowing a building is safe. It will sort out the insurers, it will sort out the lenders, it will stop further Grenfells and that's the heart of what we're doing here and I just need your help. All the campaigners, everyone in the industry, help us get this over the line and then I think um, um, it will be recognised internationally as well, um, especially in Australia. <laughs> um, but I think um, given how late it's got, it's 20 past uh, the hour. So I think um, I'll hand back to John for a bit of uh, goodbye. Uh, yes, uh, uh, well, th first of all, um, but I'd like to, to thank um, all our speakers, Steve in particular, Bishop Graham um, and, uh, and, and Matt, and also in, now in his absence, um, Daniel for presenting us with such a clear um, uh, view, overview of the legal um, background. Um, as I say, uh, I think it's uh, we have to keep the pressure on, but it says something that um, uh, Lord Greenhalge 
volunteered himself to come and join us here today. He didn't have to do that. He's a busy man. He's got other things. But he, he, this has sort of caught his imagination. We need to keep convincing him. We need to con be convincing his um, departmental civil servants. And behind him, we need to be convincing the Treasury. Because ultimately, whatever happens, this problem doesn't suddenly go away because you shift it into somebody else's basket. You know, it's, it's, it's a, whether the Treasury funds this thing or whether the contractors and developers fund it or um, or whether somebody says, well, actually, we think the, um, you know, the, 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 the hapless uh, leaseholder should um, pay for it, which personally I find morally and economically objectionable. The money has to come from somewhere. But as, as um, Steve has said, going forward, we can't have this disreputable practice of cutting corners. And as Matt has said, in this business of value engineering, which colleagues of mine in, in, in the business, you know, turn puce at the very mention of, of, of the term, because it's basically nothing other than cost cutting in areas you think you can get away with. And it's that uh, moral uh, um, decrepitude that we've got to stop for the future. So part of this is the future generations. But I want to thank all of you for um, being so supportive. You've put forward some fabulous questions. I'm sorry we can't deal with them all at the time. And had we started when we, we, we tended to, we would have got a few others. But I want to say thank you to all of you and all of those leaseholders uh, who have suffered so dreadfully for their forbearance. We will do everything we can to fix it. Thank you very much indeed, and I wish you a very good evening and also the compliments of the forthcoming season, and stay safe. Thank you. My prior question is, why do they have to pay at all? Um, but I'd, I'd want to be able to explain why we couldn't achieve exactly, as you point out, a polluter pays approach. So many noble lords, uh, the, the Right Reverend Proud Prelate, the Bishop of London, the noble Earl Lord Lytton, the noble Lord Lord Thurlow, and also my noble friend Lord Young on this. And I will listen particularly carefully to what the noble Earl Lytton has to say about drawing on the polluter pays principle to recompense leaseholders. If this was taken forward, it would in fact set in place a legacy that would restore confidence and counter the perversity of the race to the bottom in construction standards and the culture of getting away with things, uh, if you can, rather than doing a good job and go that little bit further. And so what I'm fervently hoping is that given the information on the background and the purposes and the mechanics, the government will see fit to incorporate this into the Building Safety Bill as an amendment of its own. The only comprehensive solution I am aware of is the polluter pays amendment already mentioned by the noble Lord Young. And as he has already said, that would require those developers and builders that constructed the blocks of flats that did not comply with the building regulations in course of time of construction to pay for their remediation. The polluter pays approach has much to recommend it. This well-developed proposal has also been supported by several other noble lords and I too add my support to their plea for the noble lord the minister to respond positively to this proposal. Armour, in your uh, second point in your written evidence, you say that Armour has publicly supported the polluter pays principle. It would then <laughs> endeavour to recoup that money from those who are uh, responsible. People who have uh, perhaps pushed forward products that aren't fit for purpose or people who have just constructed badly. Mm -hmm. That's why we support the polluter pays bill because unlike some other uh, amendments we've seen in the past which just says leaseholders shouldn't pay, which we absolutely agree with, it provides a route to pay. Polluter pays seems to be the only thing, the only suggestion that can go forward.